What's the topic? Paul is writing. One thing I do. One thing I do. So, sermon topic is the one important thing. My dear brothers and sisters, as you know, as I can see from everyone's life, even my life is so busy, so tiring. Am I right? Very tiring lifestyle we have. Right? We came with lots of hope from India, <laughs> expecting that we are going to live a very, uh, very jolly life. But we understand that we have to be more sincere, more hardworking to make this uh, life. Hmm? Am I right? Yeah, we have to be working double hard to get this engine still running, right? So, lots of things are happening in our lives. Not just one thing, okay? People, information boom. Okay, this internet, last 25 years, 30 years. Everyone can access so much of information that was all um, protected and hidden for so many centuries is now revealed to even a child. Think about it. The level of information that you will get only when you go to certain universities huh, are now revealed in your Google search. Any child can get that information, right? So, it is an information boom and we are not able to tackle this, handle this information boom. We are so much uh, rich of information. Okay, good information, bad information, bad stuff, good stuff, good music, bad music, huh? good influencers, bad influencers. Everything has become available to the generation, okay, to this generation. And we are pathetically failing in handling it in the right way. Philippians chapter 3 verse 13 Brothers and sisters bro I do not regard I Paul do not regard myself as having taken hold of it yet but one thing I do see Paul that's where Paul emerges okay? his genius emerges okay forgetting what lies behind reaching forward to what lies ahead amen there are hundred other things in front of Paul. There is so there is so much of failures. There is so much of joy. There is so much of pain in his life. There are so many things that he can meditate. There are hundred pathways in which he can lead his life from then on. He can turn into any person from that moment onwards. There are good people in the churches supporting him. There are bad people who are talking bad things about Paul. But he's saying there are th hundreds or thousands of things that are coming to me. But one thing I do. Do you understand? One trouble with us today is that we know too many things as I mentioned. We are not able to filter the information and take and consider only the important stuff. Okay? So, the multitude of information okay, has made us jack of all trades. Right? We know, yes brother, I know. Uh, yeah, I've heard about it. Okay? What more have you heard about? Nothing. So, so you have very superficial information about thousand other, other things. No deep information. No deep thoughts over it. But you know, you've heard everything. you come across many things, but no depth. That is the population today. Do you understand? All superficiality. So, you come across many things, but you don't know exactly what they mean, what it will lead to. Okay, so that is where we are. Okay, so when we look at the history and the, some great leaders, my dear brothers and sisters, we should understand if you go to Mahatma Gandhi, okay, in his prime time of political leadership, okay, sir, can you tell me what your life goal is? Do you think he will list out 10 to 15 goals? No, only one goal to drive away these British people from this country. How are the, how were these leaders operating? How was Abraham Lincoln operating? If you go to Abraham Lincoln in this time, 100, 200 years back, if you ask him, sir, what is your goal? What, you are, you are a president of United States. In the most troubled times of America, United States, where there was civil war happening between the white and the black people, between colonies, because they were all called American colonies. They were, they all came from all the European countries, okay, Spanish, uh, UK, uh, even Norwegian people, they all came and settled there. So the many colonies were there and there were many slaves, millions of slaves were, were, were troubled. They were building the country, but they had no rights, okay. 
So, if I go and interview Abraham Lincoln, sir, what is your life goal? What will he say? Yeah, take a paper. I'm going to give you a list of goals. No. You know what he said? Slavery must be destroyed. The union must be preserved. That is a country. It should be union means the country. United States has to be preserved. Slavery must be destroyed. Union must be preserved. One goal. Do you understand? Why are we not able to assertively do something in the kingdom of God? Is because we have a list of goals. Whereas Paul in chapter 3 verse 13 in Philippians is saying, One thing I do. <laughs> Only one goal. Hallelujah. No, I think you have to replan this year. Your one goal have to be altered. Only one goal. Have only one goal. So everyone will have a must-do items. And then comes must-do itself. You will have four or five. Huh? Then should do. Then comes want to do. Okay. So if you go to go to anyone like these leaders who have achieved something in their life, who stay in the history, who are remembered even for another 100, 200 years, Abraham Lincoln will be remembered. Even after Mahatma Gandhi will be remembered. Right? Billy Graham will be removed. So all of the tasks and activities are aligned to that one goal. You understand? This is a stress buster as well. If you have only one goal, one mindedness, single mindedness in Christ, if you have it, you can break the stress levels. So it's many more. Winfield, huh? Wesley, D.L. Moody and all. I got inspired so much. I can't sleep after reading their stories. You know, D.L. Modi, I think he was a school teacher. Or, no, I, I think he was uh, selling uh, sandals or something, like that, slippers or something. But his ministry started among the slum people. And that too, the, okay, he used to go to the slum area, those neglected areas, Chicago, very cold place, very close to Canada. He used to go and knock the doors in the slums. D.L. Moody started his ministry, kids ministry, slum area. The Lord blessed him. Blessed him. He flourished in his ministry. God spoke to him. God of the Nishad, yeah. One, only one night, only one aim, goal he had. Save all you can. That is the Holy Spirit's whispering in his ears. Save all you can. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Not a lengthy statement. Just very simple. That is the whispering of the Holy Spirit. United Kingdom. So he went across the globe. D.L. Modi was, was living in America, in Chicago. But he, he crossed the sea and went to United Kingdom. And also he preached the word of God there in Wales, in London, in Scotland. Brought a great revival. Many times he visited crossing the sea. Do you understand? He was a mighty evangelist. Dear brother, only one thing. Save all you can. So I want you... In the multitude of all the botherings that is happening in your mind, to reduce those lists into only one. Only one motto can, you can have. You cannot have a ten, ten motto, ten motors in your mind. Reduce it to one. Speak to the Lord and reduce it to only one. Okay? If you ask Billy Graham, you will say that I want to preach the gospel and I want to establish a direct connection between the people and God. No intermediate, no pastor in between. See? That is what the gospel, the pure gospel, what it will deliver. It will deliver a network connection between the people and God directly, without any intermediates, my dear brothers and sisters. So, reduce the multitude of thoughts and goals that you are trying to set for yourself and making your life difficult. So, all superficial knowledge about many things, you might get interested, but none, it's of no use. It cannot be used for your purposes. Okay? So, I would say, if, even if you look at uh, Daniel, what, what does he say in Daniel chapter 1 verse 8? You remember Daniel was a slave boy. A young, handsome young man, but a slave. Slave. Because of his, maybe he was a royal, he was coming from a royal family. He had some education, some special skills. He was taken to the palace for training. Okay? So, we are assuming that. Okay? Now, he assesses the situation in the palace of the king where he's been trained. He should be living in the palace or name or he should have been a name in a neighboring training center where young men were trained for the kingdom's purposes. Right? The king was an enemy. Now, this young man is taking a step and he's setting a goal for himself. What is that goal? If he has to live 
and do something for Jehovah, the divine one. There is only one thing he has to take care of in that situation because he was a slave. Slave means no rights for you, no salary. You'll be working throughout the day and maybe in the night also, but no salary, no rights. You'll be, you cannot question the authority. Do you understand? Atra, Mesha, Abed Nego. If you go and slap them, they can't respond. Slave. Do you understand? But one thing he does. What? Only one goal Daniel had. But Daniel made up his mind. One goal. One thing I do. That he would not defy himself with the king's choice food or with the wine which he drank. Do you understand? My dear brothers and sisters, young children, please listen. This is very important. One thing I do. One thing I do. I have only one goal. One goal that drives you to holiness, protects you from all defilement. That is the goal that you have to set. And all other mini goals will get arranged properly. If you have a proper goal. I will not defile myself with the king's choice food. That is, people will long for that food, king's food. But that is exactly what God is denying you. All rights, all human rights are already denied. The only good thing, Daniel, is the food that you are getting. That is king's food. Now you are saying, even that you are going to deny. Think about it. What is that? Way? I need dawn. He is asking for dawn. Vegetables. Think about it. Self-denial. There is great power. If you lose something for the Lord Jesus Christ. For this Jehovah. If you will deny yourself. There is a supernatural power and gifting that will start operating in your life. That will be ten times better than the wisdom of the enemies. Don't think that the Chaldeans and the other people who are also trained in the same literature, same techniques, same technology of those days, construction, civil engineering of those days, were fools. No, they were also very intelligent. But because of this abstinence that Daniel took, because of this one thing I do, can you see that? Made up his mind is nothing but Paul writing one thing I do. And no one compelled him. No one motivated him. He a leakage area. This is a power leakage area. So what is your spiritual power leakage area? Identify it and abstain yourself from those things. If it is your mouth, abstain from loose talks. If it is gossiping, abstain. That is the king's choice put. Because the choice food gives you so much of oh, oh you enjoyment, right? pleasure, abstain, voluntary abstain. Abstinence. Am I right? Do you understand what I'm saying? One thing I do. One goal is enough. For the purpose of after all hard labor. You know the hard labor at the end of the day they want to drink liquor. You understand? So that the pain, they can be relieved of that pain. Simple. Yeah? Natural. It's natural. It's not wrong. It's natural. But who's denying the wine? Not the king. Not the coach. Not Daniel's coach. Not the Daniel's manager no who's denying wine daniel himself do you understand the few let off he's denying it for himself for the sake of jehovah hallelujah such type of christians are needed my dear brothers and sisters hallelujah why has christian christians christianity become a mockery because there are no daniels there are so many power leakages in everyone life and no one cares. This is life, brother. Take it easy. Be cool, buddy. Understand? This is the mentality that is destroying Christianity. Yes. Now, in Christianity. No Daniels. No Josephs. No Moses. When Moses was operating in his anointing. The Pharaoh was trembling day and night. Every day, every night was a challenge. He was huh? shedding blood, tears. <laughs> That is how the anointing should be. Am I right, my dear brothers and sisters? This message is for me first and then to you. Okay? So please understand, there is a lack of leadership, pure leadership in Christendom that has caused us to go down to the ditches. There are not, there, there are people entering into ministry with not one goal, with multiple goals. Most of them are selfish goals. How can Christianity come up? Think of, if you are a selfish man, you are not fit to be a leader. But nowadays Christianity is encouraging selfish leaders. Understand? 
greedy people on the pulpit. They admire all oh, the pastor. Enga pastor mari aaruma. Yes. If you go to Luke chapter 10 verse 38 onwards, this is a very known event. Everyone knows it. Okay. But we are going to meditate it. Okay. So now, as Jesus and his 12 disciples were traveling along to Judea. Okay. He entered a northern Judea village called Bethany. Okay, it is not written there, but I am telling you the context in Bethany. And a woman named Martha welcomed him, welcomed Jesus into her home. And Martha had a sister called May. So far, no issues. Who was all seated at the Lord's feet. You should understand the context. In those days, women can never come near to a rabbi. But Jesus encouraged women to be at his closest. Huh? So that they too will hear the word and the gospel and the mysteries of God and the kingdom of God. You understand? So Jesus was a revolutionary. revolutionary. No rabbi will go and speak to a sinful woman. And that one Samaria. Jesus spoke. Had a proper conversation. Had deep theological discussion with a woman who had five husbands. Theology. Worship. Was just leave at this stage, Martha was also hearing the teachings of Jesus for some time. Like half an hour, 45 minutes, one hour, one and a half hours. Suddenly Martha gets reminded, after the sermon, after this teaching, I should give him good food. Okay? Mary was just caught up in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Mesmerized by the face, by the words, the pure words, pure teachings coming from the mouth of Jesus Christ, the son of the living God. My dear brothers and sisters, three days, uh, five thousand children with young kids, they were completely in attention to the Lord Jesus Christ day and night in the teachings, in a open ground. Think about it. Such powerful huh? attention Jesus can pull, pull that attention. Likewise, because Mary is seated next at, at his feet, she was just at my oh, I've never heard such glorious things. I've never heard. Such beautiful, pure words coming from a man, from a rabbi. No rabbi respected a woman. This man is allowing me to sit and listen. I'm, I'm the, in the first row, in the VIP seat. You understand, my dear brothers and sisters? Really, I'm telling you. A problem. You are very important people. He was listening to his word. Hallelujah. It was Mary listening to his word. But was distracted with all her preparations. And she came up to him. Now she had the vegetables. I haven't done the beef. I haven't to prepare the lamb. I have to do a grill. No one is there to help me. Time is running. And Mary, Mary, don't you have a heart? Serve the Lord. After the sermon, he's going, he has to eat. He has come to our house. No response. And she's signaling Mary. I believe these are my imaginations. No response. She's just admiring. Like Jeremiah ate the word. When the word came, he ate it. She would know because Mary is not cooperating. What does she do? She came up to Jesus and said, Lord Jesus, do you not care that my sister has left me to do the serving by myself? Then tell her to help me. Do you understand? So she is distracted and she is now distracting God himself. Many people are do this. People in the name of service, they distract themselves and distract others. But the Lord answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and you are distracted by many things. So, what is the topic today? One thing. What was Martha's problem? Many things. Many things. So, Jesus doesn't like many things. He wants one person with one thing in their mind. No multitasking. After this, huh? circumvention system age, multitasking is a must. <coughs> huh? But in the age of Jesus Christ, only one task, one task at a time. At a time. But only one thing is necessary. For Mary has chosen the good part, which shall not be taken away from her. So Mary is dealing with, it, with something beyond your kitchen work. More important than your kitchen work. More important than the lamb curry, the biryani, the biryani. Huh? And mandi, whatever they were preparing in the bread. The roti, my dear brothers and sisters. So many of us, we should understand in our subconscious mind, we actually support Martha. Poor Martha. No one to help. She is the one who loves Jesus so much. 
that after the sermon, after the prayer, after getting individual prophecies, <laughs> like how some pastors come and he will be hungry, right? Jesus was hungry. Many times he has said he was hungry. He wanted to sleep. Okay, so he will will be hungry, but no one cares about Jesus and about his hunger to take care of him. Everyone wants his service, his blessing, his sermon, but no one is ready to take care of him. So now, subconsciously, we actually support Martha. Am I right? We are all guilty of that sin, and we have become Marthas. Most of us are, even though because the Bible and support, we will try to support Mary superficially again. Huh? Actually, we convert, we dedicate, we submit ourselves to a Martha's ministry. Am I right or not? Martha's ministries are the prominent ministries or are the dominant ministries. She only wanted to serve. What's wrong in it? So, gee, but whatever Jesus says, he's still again saying one thing is necessary. It is the word. It is a revelation. The availability of Jesus Christ is very very limited you may not get another chance with jesus get this teaching he's going to be crucified in a few months okay your chicken biryani your lamb curry and your other stuff he doesn't care about but the word has to be installed instant within you Mary, martha you have a great ministry waiting after my crucifixion after my resurrection you have a great workload of great divine ministry but you are getting distracted by the kitchen work, by the food ministry. Do you understand what Jesus was saying? It's a very limited period, my dear brothers and sisters. Very limited. Not every time you get a chance to receive the pure word of God. Right? Yeah. Not everywhere you are served with the pure healthy food of the word of God. There is so much of adulteration involved in the dining table of the churches. In the pulpit. There is so much of adulteration, contaminated stuff, which will poison you. Mary is taking the good portion. Martha is going for the secondary activities. Do you understand? Jesus is not against preparing food. He himself prepared food, fish. He fried fish for the, for the disciples. He is a cook. I stand in the kitchen and I think about Jesus Christ because he was cooking food for his disciples. So cooking is, Jesus is not against Martha's ministry. He himself did. After resurrection, he was doing cooking ministry on the seashore. Am I right or not? Am I revealing the truth or not, my dear brothers and sisters? Not because Peter, after the resurrection, everything, all good. He was hungry. His brothers, his other disciples were all... If, if it was today's pastor, he should have gone to the streets of Jerusalem, knocked the door. See, I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. You have been blessed by this ministry. Huh? Can't you support us with some food tonight? Door by door if he goes, he should have received food. But did Peter do that? No. Bible clearly says, don't go for door knocking. Am I right? This is true or not? I don't have the scriptures. I don't have the scripture numbers, but it's all written. No door knocking. What did he do? He entered into the waters to catch fish. The only profession that he knew. And he wanted to catch fish so that he will, in, he will eat and he, his brothers will eat. See, it's a noble activity. Did Jesus condemn Peter for, for catching fish that day? No, he didn't. He wasn't successful. But fish was already prepared on the seashore. And Jesus was calling, my children, come. You understand? The Martha today. That's what Jesus was saying. Nothing wrong in cooking. Nothing wrong in serving others. It's a noble. But don't stay there. Don't get distracted there. There's more divine stuff in the table of Jesus. So what was Jesus doing? He was teaching and Mary Martha was receiving, Lazarus would have also been there because it was Lazarus' house and Lazarus' sisters were Mary and Martha. Okay? And some others might have been there. Okay? Now, what was Jesus saying in my opinion, my interpretation, and I'm reading the scriptures today, what Jesus was saying is, instead of you getting anxious and worried in the kitchen, I'm already serving food. Come and eat of it. Receive strength here in my dining table and then go and do your kitchen work. That's what Jesus was saying. What is available in, in the table of Jesus, in the banquet and the uh, of Jesus Christ? It's a magnificent table which overflows with spiritual food. First you have to be nourished spiritually with comfort, wisdom, peace, love, joy, Holy Spirit, anointing, word, strength. First eat, eat. Eat forgiveness, truth, everything. 
is at the is in the table of Jesus Christ. First, eat what He is giving, and then with that strength, you go and prepare food to serve the physical food. Do you understand? Many of us, what what we do, we go, we are called. See, for example, but in India, you will be called to marriages and receptions. Very easy in, in this culture, in this country. If you get an invitation to attend us, attend a marriage, it is a serious invitation. Okay, they are spending more than two hundred two fifty dollars on you for one one plate, one table, one chair. Okay. So it's a very serious invitation. Likewise, God is giving a serious invitation to dine with Him first. Receive my strength, my spiritual food first. It comes first. You are a spiritual being first. Then comes your physical being. You are a spiritual man first. First, eat spiritual food and then go for your physical food order. But many of us, what we do, we don't come and. Sit at the dining table that Jesus has prepared, the spiritual food for us. We are distracted. We just come for the name's sake, have a quick bite, take that one snack, eat, and say, "I've done." That's enough because it's spiritual. I don't care. Do you understand? That is the carelessness activity that has ruined Christianity and Christians. We do not value the other other recipes that we are able to cook. And when we are given a serious invitation to attend the dinner of Jesus Christ, we are not going and partaking of it, but we are waiting for someone to come out of the dinner with some leftovers. We go there. Do you understand? Our expectation for, on the spiritual side uh, is so pathetic that we are happy, satisfied with anything that is put on the table. Hey, leftovers. Do you understand what I am saying? The spiritual things are so important according to Jesus Christ. But according to the believers, we are not giving that importance. That is very sad if, you, if, I, if I have prepared such a superb dinner for my child. But they were searching in the fridge for old stuff. And they missed out on the dining table stuff that I have already prepared. The best food. Fresh, hot food. End of the day, when I come to know that they have settled down with the hmm, three days, four days old fridge stuff. Oh, my heart will be broken. Think about it. That is exactly how we are treating Jesus Christ in the spiritual side. We get excited about all other things except for the spiritual side of Christianity, which is of utmost importance. That's why Jesus was saying, Martha, you are such a wonderful person, but you know, Mary has taken the good portion. There was a good portion and Martha is missing. Today's Christians are missing out on the good portion of Christianity. They are ready for the leftover portions, mediocre portions, second, secondary portions, third rated portions of Christianity, which is of no value. It will not strengthen you. You will be more confused than an unbeliever. If you are going to eat those, if you are going to eat those crumbs that fall out from, a, from the people who are dining, you are going to be malnourished. You are going to be weakened day by day. Unbelievers more is far better sometimes than the believer. Why? Because we have not come to the table of the Lord Jesus Christ. Martha, you are distracted. You have not come to my table. Whereas Mary is eating the word immediately. Hot food, 100 percent nourishment she is receiving. Whereas you are distracted in the kitchen. Near the stove, you are burnt in the stove. Martha, you are anxious, you are getting tired. You are becoming restless. You are finding fault with the person who is next to me. Do you understand? So when you are away from the best food that Jesus offers, what will you become? You will become a complaining person. Murmurers. Just know Moses had a direct talk, face to face uh, talk and uh, experience with the, with the Lord God, Jehovah, and he's just coming down from the mountain. There are murmurers. Do you understand? Martha's in the ground. In the valley. As Mary, which is Moses here, goes to the direct presence of God, fetches the best hot food and takes it into the spirit. Do you understand? My dear, what type of congregation should I build? Martha's? No. Mary. Hallelujah. Water of the mountain, exactly he converted into Hebrew language, pronounced it when he came to the valley. Simple. No filtration, huh? no addition, subtraction. Because he knows it's a very pure word, he can't play with it. With all the stuttering he has, he was a stutterer until his death. Do you understand? 
with all the great experience he had, he still was a struggler, stutterer. But with all the stuttering, he delivered. They are the spiritual people whom we need in the church. Not celebrities, not the great talents in the church. No, we simple martyrs, simple people who will stay at the feet of Jesus Christ, who don't care whatever distractions are happening in the background, who will not respond to any signals from Martha. Think about it. Martha should have signaled at least 10 to 15 times before she directly spoke to Jesus. Because it was a serious business with Jesus. When you are disrupting a sermon, and that to a woman, disrupting a sermon, oh, and that to a rabbi, it's a serious disruption. Before that, she should have gone to that direction. You know, she should have prayed. No signaling interrupted me. So I want a group of people who will never be distracted by any Martha signal. Is it a, such a difficult thing, my dear brothers and sisters? That is the type of congregation that we should be. So what was he serving? Jesus was serving the food, right? John chapter 6 verse 35, he says what he was serving. I am the bread of life. The one who comes to me will not be hungry. And the one who believes in me will never be thirsty. He was serving the word himself. Hallelujah. He is the bread. We are going to take the communion. Huh? Okay, or listening to sermons. Okay, so my dear brothers and sisters, don't be distracted. Don't be, don't settle down for junk food. Go for the best food. The best food is Jesus Himself, the Bible itself. Hallelujah. No one can compete with Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Drink of Him, eat of Him, so thirst will go away. I assure you this. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The Bible is in um, Psalms 73, verse 26. My flesh and my heart may fail. But God is the strength of my heart. And my God, Jesus Christ, is the strength of my heart. And He is my good portion forever. Hallelujah. Not just a portion. He is the good portion that man will see. Hallelujah. My dear brothers and sisters, do you understand? What is apostolic ministry? What is the ministry that we are trying to do? Not Martha's ministry. Mary's ministry. Hallelujah. Do you agree? How many of you agree for Mary's ministry? Say Mary. Say Mary's cathedral. Hallelujah.